Have you ever noticed that the humans in this series always seem to find new giant monsters whenever they explore an uncharted island? I bet you that by the time this continuity ends, mankind will have already explored every single corner of the globe. Hello people of the internet, this is Kaiju Noir with another review. Today we'll be taking a look at Godzilla vs Mechagodzilla 2. You know what, I'm not even gonna bother explaining this stupid title, after all of the trouble I went through explaining the last film's titling issues. So moving on to the film's plot, we begin in 1992, where the Japanese government has found the remains of Mecha King Ghidorah from two films prior, and spend the next year repurposing its technology to build an advanced airborne vehicle called Garuda to combat Godzilla before eventually scrapping the project in favor of building a giant humanoid robot made to resemble their reptilian foe. In that time, a new organization is founded to specifically deal with future Godzilla attacks. Its name? The United Nations Godzilla Countermeasures Center. Cut to present-day Japan, where we meet our protagonist, Kazuma Aoki, a Pteranodon enthusiast and mechanic for the abandoned Garuda. Kazuma gets promoted to G-Force, the military branch of the UNGCC, as one of Mechagodzilla's pilots. During this time, a team of scientists investigate Adanoa, an island polluted by radiation, where they find the remains of a nest from the Mesozoic era, containing one hatched egg and another still dormant. At that moment, the mutant pteranodon Rodan, strangely referred to by his Japanese name Radon in the English dub, reveals itself to defend its sibling. This activity garners the attention of Godzilla after he receives a telepathic cry for help from the dormant egg. Once Godzilla beats Rodan to submission, the excavation team transports the egg to Japan for further study. In Japan, our female lead, Azusa Gojo, discovers the unborn creature's ability to display a red glow whenever it becomes frightened. After hearing about the possible discovery of a baby pterosaur, Kazuma rushes down to the National Life Sciences Institute to check out the egg. He later brings Miki Sagusa along after she discovers a psychic link between the egg and the plant samples that were found in its nest. The pair share this information with the scientists and attempt to amplify the psychic signal coming from the plant to an audible level, believing that the plants somehow stimulated the growth of both Rodan and the egg. Once the signal is played, the egg hatches, revealing not a pterosaur, but instead a baby godzilla -saur. As this is happening, Godzilla shows up in Japan for the baby, allowing G-Force the opportunity to launch Mechagodzilla for the first time. The battle turns out to be a disaster for G-Force, as Godzilla barely manages to escape using a variation of his nuclear pulse, and is later rejected by the baby. As punishment for his absence, Kazuma is demoted to parking lot duty, but eventually finds the opportunity to convince one of Mechagodzilla's designers to integrate Garuda into Mechagodzilla, just as G-Force is ready to put their new plan into action using the data they've uncovered from Baby Godzilla. Of all the films we've covered so far in this continuity, this one is much more reliant on it as opposed to the previous entries, which worked better as standalone films. It should be noted that this is the first time in the franchise where we truly have a military organization solely dedicated to fighting Godzilla, and it would be a concept used in later films under different names, such as G-Graspers and the Anti-Megalosaurus Force. Not only does having an organization like this on standby make sense, but it also provides the narrative an easier and quicker method of getting their protagonists involved with the plot, especially when it comes to the climax since they would take a much more active role as opposed to just standing on a roof and commentating on the final battle. I love the idea of G-Force developing Mechagodzilla through Mecha King Ghidorah's future tech, and especially how G-Force would initially create an aircraft similar to the Super X's as a means of testing out the technology before applying it to something larger in scale. 
although I do have to question exactly why they decide to pattern their robot's appearance off of the very enemy they're trying to kill. Wouldn't that be like America developing an Iron Man suit to combat the Taliban and basing its likeness off of Osama bin Laden? An explanation I've heard from fans is that this could have been done as a form of psychological warfare to throw Godzilla off guard, although I highly doubt that this would affect Godzilla as he seemed more than willing to take on a mechanical doppelganger. At least when it came to the 70s incarnation of Mecha-G, the aliens designed this so that it can purposefully disguise itself as the real Godzilla so as to avoid suspicion from humans over the existence of technologically advanced extraterrestrials. Though I guess I really shouldn't question the logistics of the series that previously had three pygmy dragons fuse into one three-headed monstrosity. As for the main cast, they fit with the plot's more militaristic theme, which, as previously stated, allows the plot to quickly establish who they are and how they are connected to the giant monsters. Kazuma, portrayed by Masahiro Takashima from Gunhead, is a slightly more comedic protagonist who's generally likable and goofy, especially when it comes to how over-the-top he is with his pterosaur obsession. This obsession of his plays into his character arc since he abandoned his post in the second act to view the egg just as Godzilla attacks. As a result, his captain, someone who was against his promotion to begin with, demotes him and further berates him for his lack of focus. This motivates Kazuma to take responsibility for his actions, which leads to him developing a plan to retrofit Garuda. This film seems to promote the idea that while we shouldn't get too involved in our hobbies, there will always be a time and place for them, and that we shouldn't do away with them completely as we grow up, as they can inspire us to push ourselves further in life. Overall, Kazuma is not a particularly complex character and fails to make a lasting impression on me, but like Kenichiro from Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, he's competent and sympathetic enough to feel worth investing in. Azusa is, in my personal opinion, the least interesting character in the story, as she's only here to care for baby Godzilla and act as a possible love interest for Kazuma. She is one of the scientists who found the egg and is the one that baby Godzilla eventually imprints himself on. To the film's credit, her motherly relationship with baby Godzilla is touching, though I wish there was more time devoted to seeing her grow more attached to him which would have made their eventual separation all the more painful, as opposed to being rather predictable. Her scenes with Kazuma, on the other hand, feel a bit forced. I do like how they initially meet up with one another, with Kazuma bouncing around in excitement over the egg while she tries to get rid of him. But by the time Baby Godzilla enters the picture, they both bond with each other over the egg, but it's mostly on a superficial level. We see them act kindly towards each other, but there's nothing there to warrant the possibility of them ever growing closer after the events of this movie, despite the film's attempt to do so. Finally, we have Miki Sagusa returning once again, though in a much larger role than in any of her previous appearances. In a surprising turn of events, she's given character development that also works as a payoff for those who have been following her since her journey began in Godzilla vs. Biollante. At this point in the series, she's been given the position of working under G-Force as one of Mechagodzilla's main pilots. Once she befriends Kazuma and discovers the potential psychic properties of the egg, she immediately jumps at the chance to find out what it is out of sheer curiosity. In a rather touching moment, she returns to the psychic training facility from Godzilla vs. Biollante, where she was originally stationed at to hone her skills. Here, she's given a warm welcome from her former friends and colleagues, which reminds the audience just how far she's come since 1989. Once baby Godzilla is studied and eventually used as bait to lure Godzilla, Miki begins to question the methods of G-Force and her role in defending Japan. After being used as a tool to help combat Godzilla for five years, she comes to the conclusion that both Godzilla and the infant deserve the chance to live, and that she would pursue a more peaceful means of protecting Japan where no innocent lifeforms can get hurt. The brilliant thing about this moral conflict is that neither her nor G-Force is really labeled right or wrong. The head honchos at G-Force clearly express their concern for the baby's safety, yet bring up the indisputable fact that by using baby Godzilla as bait, they would be able to have a higher chance at saving more lives in the process. Now that we've covered the human side of the plot, let us go over the monster roll call, and boy do we have a lot to talk about here. I suppose we should start with the most prominent of our three newcomers, Mechagodzilla. First off, I have to say that this is by far my favorite incarnation of the Mechanical Menace. The reasons why he's my favorite is something I'll delve into in a later video, but for now, I'll say that his sleek and shiny new appearance definitely gives him a more heroic look, which is interesting when you consider that while the original Mecha-G was an antagonistic weapon of mass destruction, this incarnation would start a trend of portraying future versions of Mechagodzillas as humanity's final line of defense against giant monsters. I also like the idea of giving him a jetpack containing shoulder cannons, 
since it's sort of a callback to giant robot shows like Mazinger Z and their detachable backpacks, though I feel that Super Mecha Godzilla was specifically a reference to the 1985 anime Zeta Gundam, since in that series, the Gundam Mark II received an upgrade in the form of the G-Defensor, a flying spacecraft similar in appearance to the Garuda that provided extra firepower when attached to the Mark II. And you know what the Mark II was called in this mode? That's right, the Super Gundam. As for the effects used to portray him, his suit doesn't have a whole lot of mobility due to the fragile and experimental material used to construct it. Although I like that this real-life weakness in the suit is translated into the film, as whenever the monsters get past Mechagodzilla's numerous projectile attacks, he becomes virtually helpless. Our next major player, Rodan, looks fantastic. Looks being the key term here. Unlike previous incarnations of Rodan, where he was portrayed by a man in a suit, he's brought to life here exclusively by means of a puppet and an animatronic head. I theorized that this was done to give Rodan more anatomically accurate proportions, as well as make the size difference between him and Godzilla roughly the same as the average theropod and pterosaur. As much as I love his new design, the puppet used to portray him is utterly abysmal. The issues that plagued both Mothra and Batra are even more prominent here, as the puppet is incredibly stiff, showcasing rigid movements in the wings and head. For God's sake, his arms lack any visible joints whatsoever. Not even elbows! This makes Rodan's fight scenes awkwardly handled, especially during his fight with Godzilla on Adonoa Island, where sparks are used to portray physical tooth and claw damage, where in the past, sparks were used to portray damage from missiles and beam attacks. Now, if sparks were used on a giant robot, that would make sense. Spandex-clad superheroes? Fine, if a little bit weird. But flesh-and-blood monsters? Yeah, not so much leniency there. Later in the film, Rodan regains his strength and becomes Fire Rodan by means of contrived writing. His fight with Mecha G is slightly better since he now has a beam attack to rely on instead of stiff physical attacks. Though in the end, I have to say that this version of Rodan is pretty much a letdown. I like what they did with his character and how he ties into the plot by making him Baby Godzilla's pseudo sibling and Godzilla's rival, but he never has that much influence over the events of the story due to getting his ass handed to him in every fight. It's like he's become the new Anguirus of the series, though what the filmmakers do to him in the final battle slightly redeems him in my eyes. Finally, we get to cover Godzilla once again, who thankfully serves an actual purpose in this installment. In the past, we've seen hints of a Godzilla blindingly searching for someone like him, be it him following bird calls or Biolante's cries for help. Now we see that aspect of his character come back in full force as he responds to baby Godzilla's psychic presence. His determination in protecting and gaining access to this infant is greatly expressed as he risks life and limb over it. And once he reaches the baby, he's actually respectful towards the creature by leaving it alone when he realizes that it's afraid of him. By the end, he manages to take baby Godzilla under his wing and finally abandons his grudge against humanity now that he has found a new purpose in life. Speaking of which, this new interpretation of the son of Godzilla is a huge improvement over Minya in terms of design and personality. He acts much more like a natural animal and is very attached to those he considers his parental figures in the situations he finds himself in. His psychic ability to use plants to stimulate his development is quite an interesting one since Godzilla lacks this ability, though the fact that he's a different breed of Godzilla sore and the fact that he's a mutant can attest to this difference. In terms of his design, I like how it references the Godzilla Saur from 1991, and how it manages to make the cutesy anime aesthetic actually work in live action. Previous attempts at translating the innocent wide-eyed look into live action creatures have not worked well for me personally in the past, but I feel that the filmmakers managed to successfully blend this aspect of him while also incorporating more realistic proportions and features to the rest of his body. As for the special effects, they do their best at giving audiences a flashy spectacle, but the consequences of the Beam Wars trilogy are in full effect here, meaning that we have creatures with limited movement, as previously stated with Mechagodzilla and Rodan, and thus rely on glitter, sparks, and beam attacks galore. Even Godzilla seems to have gotten a more bulkier suit that limits his fighting capabilities, though I only guess that this was done to make the suit more durable against so many explosives. Or it was a choice made by Koichi Kawakita in order for Godzilla to match Mechagodzilla's size. Despite all of this, the monster fights are thankfully saved by Akira Fukube's score, boasting a new theme for Mechagodzilla while updating Godzilla's theme with a more uplifting and triumphant tone. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 is a film with major strengths 
and numerous hindrances along the way, the story is more reliant on continuity and provides a more rewarding experience to fans who have been following this series. On the other hand, it's not as easy to get into for someone who's just dropping in without prior knowledge. The character of Miki Sagusa is given a greater amount of spotlight and is more fleshed out as a result, yet her co-stars are pretty standard in terms of Godzilla protagonists and are not as impactful. Finally, as entertaining as the special effects are, the weaknesses of Kawakita and his crew are much more prominent, which would have led to a very problematic experience had it not been for Godzilla's motivations and Ifakube's music. In the end, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 does just enough to be an all-around exciting film, but not enough for it to stand among the best of the best, which is why I'm giving this film a 3 out of 5. Join me next time when we take a small break from Godzilla as I take a look at the only monster movie Toho made during this time that's not related to Godzilla in any way. Stay tuned for my review of Orochi the Eight-Headed Dragon. Until next time everybody, take care. <laughs>